there are three important things that we're doing on the skeleton plane. First, we're giving users the ability to see the structure. Second, we're giving them a way to move through it. And third, we're giving them a way to act on what they see. Put another way, this is the place where we're starting to give the function we've developed some form. The skeleton plane focuses on more concrete issues of presentation, what the person sees, which specifically means answering some questions. What form will the product take? How will users move around? How will they do things? How will content be presented? And how will it be manipulated? The skeleton plane is created through interface design, first and foremost, which, as we said, provides users with the ability to do things. If I can act on what I see, if I can touch it, click it, tap it, move it, act on it, okay, that's part of the interface. That's my bridge. It's my pathway into making the system do something for me. But we're also dealing with navigation design, which essentially allows us to go places, specifically in larger sets of information, uh, large websites or enterprise systems or even applications, okay, apps that live on your mobile phone. Navigation design is what allows you to go from this screen to that screen to the next screen. And in some cases, it also is what allows you to move through steps or sequences or flows uh, within a single screen. One of the core things we're trying to do at this point is make decisions that enable positive experiences, okay, that ensure that the person on the receiving end that's interacting with the system has a useful, valuable experience, that it meets their need, that it serves their expectations, that it helps them achieve their goals. The work that we're doing at this point has to enable several important principles that essentially define positive user experience. First and foremost, we have to rapidly establish the product's value in the user's mind. In other words, they have to see and experience something or multiple things, uh, in some cases, very quickly in order to feel like the time and effort they're going to invest is going to help them do something, right? It's going to be worthwhile. The outcome is going to be what they're hoping to accomplish. So that's establishing value. Next, we have to lead that person toward continuing the experience, which essentially furthers the relationship as well. In some ways, it's a lot like a first date. The quality of the experience and subsequent experiences uh, determine whether you're going to stick around or not. <laughs> okay, but that's partly, you know, what our job is when we're dealing with the interface. To convince the person to stick around and uh, explore and learn and use things. We're also looking for ways to introduce specific content at the most relevant, most appropriate points in the experience. We're trying to figure out, okay, when does the person want this information? Are they ready for it yet? Uh, is it the appropriate place in the workflow? What do they need to see here and what do they need to be able to do with what they see? Every single click or every tap or every swipe or whatever it is should add immediate value. There should be an immediate sense that what I just did provided me with something useful, something valuable, okay? The action I just took was worthwhile. It furthered me along my given path. It got me one step closer to achieving my goal. So all these little discrete actions that we take from screen to screen also should add positively to the overall experience over time. All these smaller actions that I take should lead up to some grander result. I should constantly feel like I am on the right path. I'm on the way to achieving my goals. I'm on the way to bigger and better things. Forward progress in football terms, right? I'm, I'm moving forward even when I'm doing something that's relatively menial. The point of all this is that every single thing that the person does on the screen, okay, everything that they see, everything that they touch, everything that they inter interact with, should all work together to provide a sense that what's happening is positive, it's useful, and it's valuable. The skeleton plane is also the place where we start to see the relationship between features and overall usability. And in truth, that relationship is pretty simple. Essentially, the more features that anything has, the less likely that its usability is good. That means at any given point in time, the number of features or functions that are available to us on the screen has a, has a direct effect on how useful that product is. There's a system that I recently uh, was asked to evaluate, a learning management system that has over 700 features. 
the company feels that, you know, offering all these features gives them a competitive advantage. And, you know, from a sales and marketing standpoint, I get it because lots of people like to see that sort of checkbox functionality where they see the three systems compared and and they can say, well, look at all the stuff that ours does that these others don't. More is better, right? The thing is, there's miles and miles and miles of research that says otherwise. Excessive features simply make these things more complex. It increases the user's and administrator's learning curve. It means there are additional taps, additional clicks, additional steps required to accomplish even the most basic tasks. That means there's more effort required on the administrative side, on the business side as well, to configure these things, to maintain them. All those features also tend to increase cost. So there isn't really any core benefit on the user side in terms of hard dollars and cents either. And finally, what happens is that when you have that many features, you can be pretty sure that something's not going to work correctly the minute there's a new browser update, okay? <laughs> In any of the, you know, the, the three major browsers, if you're dealing with Internet Explorer or Firefox or Chrome, one upgrade is all it's going to take to derail a significant percentage of all those things. So more complexity is almost never a good match for usability. In order to design anything successfully, you have to have a, a strong understanding of conventions. And that's largely because habit and reflex account for much of our daily interactions. The ingrained habits that we have, the automatic unconscious reflexes, the way that we react to things, make up a, a large, large portion of our everyday actions. Without those two things, without habit, without reflex, we pretty much wouldn't be able to do anything. <laughs> From the way that you get out of bed all groggy and somehow manage to make coffee in the morning, even though you're not even really conscious of doing it, to the common things that you do every time you pick up your phone or your tablet or open your laptop screen. Those things happen reflexively. They happen unconsciously. So our ability to do anything depends on the accumulation of all these reflexes, most of which are pretty small. Conventions, things that we automatically instantly recognize as familiar, are what allow us to use those reflexes. And that's because they match our expectations of what something is supposed to do, you know, what it's supposed to be like. When we see something that's familiar, when we get a signal that's familiar, a visual signal in, in this case, uh, we know what to do with it. We've been there before, we get it, we understand it, we interpret it. There's no thought required. The body and the mind just reacts, you know, as one. If I show you this set of symbols, I'd say there's a pretty good chance that the majority of you know exactly what most of these do. Why? Because you've seen them on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop, on the internet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are conventional symbols that have been used over and over and over across different kinds of applications, different kinds of systems, different kinds of software. But they always, always, always mean the same thing do the same thing, act the same way. The only time you deviate from a well-established convention is when there's a clear, obvious benefit to doing so. And most times, even when you do deviate, uh, it's pretty minor because the core relationship that the person has to a certain convention, a certain paradigm, a certain way of doing things is really strong and well-established. Uh, I'll give you an example. On the iPhone, the dial pad looks like this. This number configuration that you see is pretty much universal. And if you go all the way back to the first touch tone phones that had buttons instead of a rotary dial, this is essentially the arrangement of the keys. Three rows of numbers, zero in the center, star sign on the left, pound sign on the right. That's universal. It's been the same way since 1962 <laughs> when touch tone phones first came out. That's a strong convention. We absolutely automatically know how to use this. Now, when the Android system came out, you'll notice that it looks visually a little different. We're using a different font. Things are colored differently. Uh, we don't have the, the rigid containers that the iPhone has. But guess what? The convention, the format, the layout of the interface is exactly the same. Three rows of numbers, zero at the bottom center, star, pound. That's because while the Android obviously needed to differentiate itself in some way, right, to self-identify as, you know, this is something different, this is something unique, they did not attempt to do away with the convention. Why? Because we know that. Because doing so would be extremely disruptive 
to effectively using the phone. It would break our habit. It would interfere with our reflex. And therefore, we'd probably be pretty frustrated at our first attempt to use the phone. And if we're frustrated at our first attempt, we probably won't try again. We're going to gravitate towards something that automatically matches our comfort, our connection to the things that we already know. 